title to the lesson this morning is How Much More? How Much More? And I've got to be honest with you, when I first started this, uh, I wasn't thinking of some of the things that, that I, I found when I began to, to study this a little bit more and look at it uh, a little bit more. Um, but I'll try not to, to uh, uh, go too long this morning. It would be easy to do because there was a whole lot more that I found, and, and it really kind of fits with how much more, uh, the idea with this. But I want us to, first of all, look at, at Jesus Look at what Jesus did in comparison with what happened with Adam. And when we think about uh, the fact that Adam sinned, that it took us away from God, turn to Romans chapter 5, and let's look at the comparison that is there. And it's really comparisons that we're looking at this morning uh, when we ask the question, how much more? Uh, in Romans chapter 5, uh, there's, the phrase comes up more than once within the chapter. And it's not really that long of a chapter, and I want to read it so that we get the context of what's being said there. Uh, some of it can be kind of misunderstood easily if you don't compare it to other passages even, um, such as sin being passed on and things like that, which we know from passages like Ezekiel chapter 18 that the, the son does not bear the iniquity of the father. And yet Adam started something by allowing sin to come into the world through himself and Eve, and this is what this chapter is talking about, is us following that nature and, and what Christ has done to break that pattern. So starting in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. He starts out this chapter by, by following up this idea that we have been justified. That we've been made right by God himself because of what Jesus has done, and that we grow in this, even as he kind of goes through this step by step. And as you can see, I mean, we could spend the rest of the morning in each, each one of these or just pick one and, and do a sermon on that this morning. But that we recognize that our hope is something that doesn't disappoint. In verse 6, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, Though, for a good person, someone, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood. Since we have been justified by his blood. God is just in forgiving us because of his sacrifice. God is just in accepting us, even as we can pray and we can go before his throne, even as we live a life that is worshiping him, even as we can talk about God and Jesus to other people. We live that because of what he has done. God is just in accepting us. So again, verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? How much more? Now he's going to repeat this phrase. Verse 10, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? He didn't just die, but he lives. I mean, we can see it in the life that he lived before he died, but what about the resurrection that declares him, the first chapter of Romans, declares him to be the Son of God with power. If he died for us, how much more are we going to be able to stand before God justified even by his life that he now lives? That life isn't just a life that is separate from us. I mean, Paul elsewhere, like to the Galatian Christians, and, and we're familiar with this passage, 
that the life that we're living is what? It's Christ living in us. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. How much more will we, we be justified by the life of Christ that isn't limited to something that maybe we think of distant from us, but something that is within us? Not only, verse 11, is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We've been brought back together with God. Because there was a separation took place. And that's what he's getting ready to talk about. Verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered into the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. There's something different. The gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? With what sin could do, how much more could Jesus do? Verse 16, Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of that one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? If you're going to make a comparison, the damage that sin could do, that happened in the Garden of Eden that continued on even to the time of Moses to the giving of the law. And he's going to mention that here in just a moment too, again. But the damage that that could do, condemning all under sin because it started there. How much more will the blood of Christ overflow to the many? How much more will the blood of Christ for the justification of all Verse 18, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that, just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we're comparing sin and the damage of it and the life of Christ, how much more is in the life of Christ? It wins. It's victorious. And if you read through Revelation, if you get nothing else from Revelation, what do you get? Victory. He wins. So therefore, the question, how much more? And how do you put, how do you put a figure on that? In Luke chapter 12, We're going to look here twice, actually. But Luke chapter 12, this time beginning in verse 22. Luke 12, 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. That's easy to read, isn't it? How 
How many worry? Are we supposed to? No. Are we willing to repent of that? You know, repent doesn't just say, I do it. Repent doesn't just say, uh, I'm sorry. Repent says, I'm going to do different. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. How much more valuable you are than birds. Jesus said this before he died. I mean, it was, I mean, they would recognize, yeah, we're worth more than birds. This, this is rhetorical question, if you will, and it's, it's not a question, but it, it, it's an obvious. How much more valuable are you than birds? You're created in the image of God. And look back at the creation and see what was good and what was very good. You are worth so much more than the birds are. Yet God takes care of them. So he's saying, don't worry. Consider how much more you are worth. Who of you, verse 25, by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Just an hour. Who by concern, by worry, can add an hour to their life? It's not going to happen. He says that's a little thing can't do that, why would you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow, verse 27. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? If God can take care of the things that are just, they're just momentary. We had, uh, I want to call them flags, irises, right? Flags? Uh, purple ones that were just absolutely beautiful this year. They, they were just, I mean, they, the, the color in them just was brilliant. I was weed eating around there yesterday. And it's, they're just shriveled up brown, ugly looking things right now. They were just there for a little while, but so brilliant. I mean, look what God did with that. And they're just there for a little while. I mean, the, the tiger lilies are getting ready to bloom. And you know what? When they're all done, because they'll bloom for just a little while, Radonna will tell me the same thing she told me last year. Cut them down. They're just there for a little while. And yet, so beautiful. It's what God did. If something that's here for just a little while, it's not, there's no intent for eternity for those things, let alone a year. Just so very brief. And yet, how God provided for that. Can he provide for us? How much more are you worth than an iris? than a flower. There's a little bit more in that passage. I mean, just, just the encouragement for us to recognize God's provision for us, and it's because of how much more valuable we are. In Hebrews chapter 9, 
Hebrews chapter 9. You know, last week as we were looking at the sin list, and concluded we really don't want one, we made some comparison between the things that we found in the Old Testament, in particular even under the law, and there was some, I, I enjoyed the comments, uh, both last Sunday and through the week concerning uh, some of that, and and how that when we, when we make that kind of comparison, even to today, and even though there are some short lists that are there, that they're not meant to be all-inclusive, that it goes deeper, it goes to what is written upon our hearts, upon our inward parts, and we talked about that. That the people under law developed this attitude, and this was mentioned to me, of, of they were doing it just simply to, to be able to check something off. They were doing it even out of guilt. They were doing it out of responsibility to keep the law. But then today, that our motivation should go so much deeper than that, that because of our love of Christ and love of fellow man, and even as was shared with me as well, I think one of the classes was even studying it last week, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, Jesus himself saying, it's all fulfilled in these. So when we look at that, I mean, isn't, that's a comparison, isn't it? I mean, that we're seeing from, from how these people live their life being bound under the law and how Jesus has set us free to live a life of love with a motivation of love, fulfilling the law even by doing so. And so I wanted us to look in Hebrews chapter 9 then, and in, in this chapter, he says, beginning in verse 11, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. And here he's making a comparison. The tabernacle they would have had, it was made with human hands. The tabernacle that he entered through is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of, blood, of the blood of bulls and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. There's a comparison. He didn't take, his own, he didn't take the blood of bulls and goats before God, asking for forgiveness for the sins of the people and even for himself, entering into the most holy place but rather he took his own blood. Verse 13, The blood of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. Verse 14, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, Cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. If these people could go through the motions, take the blood of bulls and goats to outwardly be clean, how much more then is the blood of Jesus, who he says is unblemished himself in this comparison with the blood of bulls and goats, how much more is the perfect Jesus taking his blood before God, going to cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve God. Once again, it goes deeper than us just being clean. It goes deeper than just saying, okay, now you can go to heaven. It goes deeper than saying, okay, now you don't have any more sin. He's saying this cleanses our conscience how many sins are you holding on to that you're supposed to be forgiven for? 
How many things are still holding you back from serving God the way that you should be serving God? He says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, if we take that, those, those commas out of there and that middle part out, how much more then will the blood of Christ cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Jesus died to set you free from those sins. If those sins are still holding you back from serving God because you think you're not good enough or you think because you did this, now you can't do that, what are you saying about the blood of Jesus? This is what he did. So how much more is the blood of Jesus worth? But you know, this goes both ways. I want you to look over at chapter 10. Chapter 10. If the blood of Jesus is worth so much more, if what we have in Jesus is worth so much more, then let's look at chapter 10. Start with me in verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Let me read that again. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now here's the comparison. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And we can turn back there and read it. I mean, that's what the law said. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? If we see the severity under the law of Moses, has anybody ever noticed the severity under the law of Moses? <laughs> it's pretty severe. You go back and read it. It's pretty severe. If people want to make a point, and it's interesting how the world does this, they want to make a point against Christianity, they'll always go back and pick something out of the Old Testament and say, this is what you're holding to. So if a son disobeys his parents, he's supposed to be stoned? That's severe, isn't it? And they'll go back and they'll pick these things up and say, this is what you're holding to when that's, we're not under that law. But we see the severity. We see the penalty for sin. But if we enjoy how much more we have in Jesus, and we do, don't we? I mean, we've seen these passages. We saw it just a moment ago in Hebrews chapter 9. If we enjoy how much more we have in Jesus, then we need to recognize how much more penalty there is if we trample underfoot the Son of God. If we say, I don't care. I'm going to live my life the way that I want to. I don't care if this is sin. This is what I want to do. I don't care if this is wrong. I'll take care of it later on. And we deliberately keep on sinning. There is no more sacrifice. And how much more severe do you think the penalty ought to be for somebody who tramples underfoot the Son of God and insults the Spirit of grace? Not law, but the Spirit of grace. How much more? So there we've seen both sides. But I want to end on this note. Praise team wants to come up. I've asked a lot of questions. They've all started with how much more. 
Well, how much more? Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, that to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So imagine it. Ask it. And you won't be able to measure how much more he'll do. According to his powers that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let it be so. If you're living a life of guilt, you don't have to. He's already done so much more. If you need to respond to that, there's our invitation. You can come as we stand and sing together.